Attorney Redoble is a senior associate of Sky Law Offices. He obtained his Juris Degree from his Juris Doctor degree from the UP College of Law, where he was awarded with the Dean's Medal in Academic Excellence and the Jacinto Prize for Remedial Law. His practice areas include taxation, corporate law, labor, and litigation. He served as a Chief Political Affairs Officer in the House of Representatives prior to joining Sky Law as one of its senior associates. After Attorney Redoble, we will, now, we will then have Attorney Marlo Uy. Similar to Attorney Redoble, Attorney Uy obtained his Juris Doctor from the UP College of Law. His main practice areas include dispute resolution, banking law, and corporate law. He has extensive experience in representing individual and corporate clients before various courts and quasi-judicial agencies. He has also advised multinational clients on matters relating to doing business in the Philippines. Attorney Uy is a member of the Law, Associ Law Association for Asia and the Pacific. He is also a member of the Operations Committee of the Philippine International Center for Conflict Resolution and is a trained arbitration tribunal secretary of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. Attorney Redoble will speak first to be followed by Attorney Uy. We will then conduct the Q&A session after both speakers have presented their lectures. Attorney Redoble, we pass the virtual floor to you. Thank you, Attorney Kua. A pleasant afternoon to everyone, in spite of the heat, I hope. Um, again, welcome to our webinar for this afternoon. As all of you may know, we are a week away from the scheduled end of the ECQ. However, even at this point of time, several uncertainties remain. None of us know which areas will transition to GCQ and which areas will be covered by ECQ after May 15. Further, the regulations and rules applicable to quarantine areas are constantly being updated, revised, and changed. Amidst all this uncertainty, it is our goal to assist you in navigating through both a possible extension of the ECQ as well as the eventual transition to, from ECQ to GCQ. And this will require us to cover several topics. First of all is the applicable rules and regulations for both ECQ and GCQ, the travel restrictions, which we'll just briefly go over, the businesses allowed to operate under both regimes, workplace health standards, um, GCQ road travel regulations, and lastly for me, searches and seizures, after which my partner will discuss regulated and prohibited activities, arrests, as well as entrapments and by busts. So what rules currently govern the ECQ and GCQ regimes? Of course, the latest one we have is Executive Order Number 112, which states which areas are under GCQ and ECQ and which adopts IATF Resolution Number 30 as amended in order to set the guidelines that govern ECQ and GCQ areas. We also have DTI Memorandum Circular Number 20-21, which governs the operation of malls during GCQ, and DTI Memorandum Circular Number 20-22, which broadens or expands the list of industries and businesses allowed to operate both under ECQ and GCQ, which provides much needed clarification. Then we have the DTI and DOLE Joint Interim Guidelines on Workplace Prevention and Control of COVID-19 for businesses operating during quarantine. And of course, the Department of Transportation's Omnibus Public Transport Protocols and Guidelines in relation to LTFRB Memorandum Circular Number 2020-017, which will govern road transport during GCQ. So first topic, travel restrictions. Of course, the quarantine has affected two primary aspects of our life, mainly travel and business operations. For travel, we are all familiar with who are allowed to travel, meaning those who are trying to access essential goods and services, as well as those who are, who are working in establishments permitted to operate during ECQ or GCQ. And of course, certain individuals are restricted in travel, namely or including those who are below 21, those who are 60 years old or above, those with immunocompromised, 
for those who are immunocompromised um, and all as well as those who have comorbidities and pregnant women. So these individuals can only travel if it is indispensable under the circumstances for them to access essential goods or services or for them to go to work, meaning they have nobody else to buy food or they have nobody else to buy food or medicines for them or they need to have a personal checkup with their physician or they really need to report to work because their presence is required or is necessary there. Of course, when you're traveling, you need to have several things with you. One is, a, one is the face masks or the fa wearing of face masks, which my partner will discuss in detail later on. But also, to facilitate your travel and to avoid complications, we recommend having any of these travel documents. One is, of course, the quarantine pass issued by your local government unit, the validity of which is governed by local ordinances. And the primary purpose is really to allow you to pass freely through barangay checkpoints. Then, of course, the IATF ID issued by the DTI previously. Although they are no longer being processed, previous, pre previously issued IATF IDs are still recognized at checkpoints. The new, and of course, the newest um, form of identification, the rapid pass. So it uses a QR code for efficiency and to minimize contact between uh, officers at the checkpoint as well as people on board vehicles or those traveling. So far, it is applicable in NCR, but and considering the possible extension of the ECQ, we still recommend the application or applying for rapid pass beyond right now and even beyond May 15. And lastly, this is also explicitly recognized under current regulations company IDs and certificates of employment should still be recognized at checkpoints, but we emphasize that they must contain the employee's name, photograph, residence, place of work, the company name, business, the bis nature of the business, as well as its contact details. Part of travel, especially after May 15, will be traveling between areas covered by ECQ and areas covered or under GCQ, or as the regulations call it, interzonal travel. This is allowed only under limited exceptions, exceptional circumstances. I, I would only like, you can go over them briefly, I would only like to emphasize that workers in establishments permitted to operate during ECQ and GCQ are also exempted or are allowed to travel between areas under ECQ and GCQ. So I think this is the most relevant concern right now. And I'll also go, go over this briefly. International travel is still severely restricted. So primarily, it is only allowed for OFWs, permanent residents abroad, and foreign nationals. Now that we've gone over the travel restrictions, I think this is the topic which is more relevant to our purposes. The business, the business is allowed to operate under ECQ and GCQ. So I'm just showing you the businesses allowed to operate under ECQ at this point in time. Um, I think most of us are familiar already with who is allowed to operate under ECQ and who is not. I'll just give you time to go over these industries. I separated hotel operations because they are singled out under the regulations. Suffice to say that they are only limited to providing basic lodging to certain individuals listed here. I also separated them because the restrictions applicable to hotels are the same whether an area is under ECQ or GCQ. Which of course brings us to business operations under GCQ. We have several categories here. So category one are the businesses or industries allowed to operate at full capacity. 
category two are the businesses allowed to operate from 50 to 100 percent of capacity. Category three are the businesses allowed to operate up to 50 percent on site, meaning work from home arrangements are still allowed. So the level of flexibility is given to the employer to determine whether the rest of the 50 percent will not report to work or will avail of a work from home arrangement or any other flexible working arrangement. Category four are those who are still not allowed to operate even under GCQ. So I'll just go over each category. Category one involves mostly businesses which were allowed to operate during ECQ, meaning those providing essential goods and services, utilities, healthcare, etc. One particular industry I would like to emphasize is real estate because they are considered as category one by the DPI and they are allowed to fully operate under GCQ. Unlike previously during ECQ, only leasing was allowed. But under GCQ, real estate businesses are allowed to operate at full capacity, separate and independent of the construction operations. For category two, these are manufacturing businesses of non-essential goods, uh, whether it's paper, wood, uh, metal, other industrial products, mining, e-commerce, those export-oriented enterprises, um, essential construction, meaning which is qualified to primarily limited to those necessary for disaster risk reduction and management and rehabilitation. Repair and maintenance services, housing and office services. Category three mm, primarily involves service industries, whether it's financial services, uh, banks, money remittance, etc., BPOs, legal service, legal services, accounting services, other professional services, non-leisure services, wholesale, wholesale and retail trade, except for a few exceptions, like for example, toy stores are still prohibited from operating. And also malls and commercial centers. So unless a particular stall or business within the mall falls under category four, malls and commercial centers are now allowed to operate. Uh, I'd like to emphasize at this point that dining inside is still not allowed. So only takeout um, and delivery is allowed. And then category four, or still those who are, which are still not allowed to operate under GCQ, schools, le uh, business, businesses involved in leisure, amusement, gaming, fitness, as well as travel and tourism. Basically, those involved in mass gatherings or businesses which, by their nature, require several people to gather in one place. Schools, however, I need to clarify. Higher educational institutions are allowed to have alternative um, learning arrangements. So, for example, online classes in order to finish out the current, ter the current academic term. So those are the businesses allowed to operate under GCQ. If you look at DTI Memorandum Number 20-22, it provides a more comprehensive list. Uh, I did not include all the details because we might run out of time, but I do recommend referring to that list provided. Of course, once businesses begin to operate, we do need to observe several workplace health standards to avoid and minimize the spread of COVID-19. At the onset, I would like to emphasize that as a general rule, the guidelines serve more as a guide than an obligation. Nevertheless, for as long as you can comply with them, we do recommend adopting all possible measures you can. And for those that you have issues with com complying with or have difficulty complying with, we recommend also that you consult with the DOLE and the DTI on how to go about complying with those recommendations or guides. So for workplace health standards, the, DT, the joint DTI DOLE guidelines provide several categories. The first one being physical and mental resilience. So your primary obligation here really is to inform your employees about how to boost and strengthen their immune system, including having a healthy diet, having fluid, proper fluid consumption, 
enough, getting enough sleep and exercise, and regularly washing their hands and other hygiene practices. It also may include providing free medicine and vitamins to your employees, as well as having a system to refer your employees suffering from anxiety and mental health issues to counseling. So the next category is the workplace health standards to be observed at entrances, both for buildings as well as the offices themselves. So number one is providing face masks. Under the regulations, a cloth mask is allowed so that it will allow you to minimize costs because instead of providing disposable face masks, you can just provide cloth masks for your employees to wash. But it is recommended that in addition to the cloth, cloth mask. An additional filter um, is also provided to be placed under the mask. So based on the regulations, even a tissue or a piece of tissue will suffice. Uh, next, visitors and employees have to fill out the health symptom questionnaire. The form is attached to the DTI Dolly guidelines and I believe we will be posting the copy of the form on our Facebook page and to the FAQs we will post afterwards. Temperature checks are of course mandatory. And then sanitation and disinfection, meaning people entering must be able to sanitize their hands and any goods or whatever delivery will come in will also have to be disinfected. Lastly, social distancing measures must be established for people gathered at the entrance, whether it is a queue to enter the building or people waiting for their rides or something else. Please observe social distancing. Have markers, have people assigned to impose social distancing. Of course, part of the entrance health, health standards is establishing a screening protocol. This is the sample given by the DTI, Joint DTI Dolly guidelines. So based on the temp temperature check, it, um, how you will deal with the visitor of the, or the employee will be determined by their body temperature. So if it's 37.4 or lower, they just need to accomplish the form. If it's 37.5, they have to be in a holding area and their temperature will be checked afterwards. If it's more than 37.5, then they cannot enter the building. I would just like to emphasize that for those who will have issues with providing for a holding area, you can actually choose to skip isolation and just refuse entry um, to your employees who have a temperature of 37.5. However, separate from the screening protocol, you must also have a transport and testing protocol meaning if an employee is suspected to have or is suspected to be infected by COVID-19, you either refuse entry or put them in isolation. But in addition to that, and especially if the symptoms are severe, you must also have a company protocol for transport and testing, which will require one, persons in your isolation facility should have a PPE, assuming you have one. Second, you must already have arrangements for ambulance conduction or any other transport of the suspected um, COVID-19 patient to the hospital slash testing center. And it is also recommended that you already have a, an arrangement with a DOH accredited testing center on how to, on how to test your employees. If you look at the guidelines, they don't make any they don't make mention of rapid testing. The only testing explicitly recognized by the DTI Dolly guidelines is polymerase chain reaction or PCR testing. Even the DOH recognizes this as the gold standard. So for those who are curious about rapid testing, yes, you may impose rapid testing as an additional security measure, but ultimately what is necessary and what you will have to do is to have a PCR testing arrangement or PCR testing protocol. Lastly, should you have a suspected COVID-19 patient, you have to decontaminate the office using the appropriate disinfectant, or meaning, they, this is highly technical, so I'm not a chemist, but the regulations say it's chlorine bleaching solution and 1% phenol disinfectant. 
and the work can only resume after 24 hours from the contamination. Lastly, those who were exposed to suspected COVID-19 COVID patient must go through mandatory home quarantine for 14 days. So that's for the entrance protocols. Within the workplace, there should also be several protocols in place. First, there should be disinfection every two hours. Unlike with um, the previously mentioned decontamination, there is no suggested disinfectant to be used under the guidelines. All that is required is that there is disinfection every two hours of the workplace as well as all the other areas that are commonly held, meaning doorknobs, uh, I guess, passcode, uh, buttons, etc. Um, you must also have a constant supply of soap and water, and sanitizers must be placed in high traffic areas, including corridors, conference rooms, elevators, stairways, and other passageways. And yes, social distancing must still be observed within the workplace. What does this mean? First of all, this applies to all areas, including elevators. So even within elevators, social distancing must be imposed and there should be a limit to the number of individuals allowed within each elevator at any given point in time. Second, eating in communal places is discouraged. If it's possible for employees to eat at their workplace, then better. If not, there should be restrictions placed on the number of people eating in the communal area at any given point in time. So scheduling or having shifts for lunch is one alternative to minimize the number of people in the common area. Minimizing contact is also important. So this is slightly related to the uh, um, regulations governing the, or rather the health standards applicable to within the work. So one is imposing alternative work, uh, alternative or flexible work arrangements to minimize the number of people within the office. So this will involve either work from home arrangements or uh, rotation of the employee so that there are fewer people within the office at any given point in time. Lastly, consciously avoid or minimize face-to-face -face interactions between people as well as with the clients. As much as possible, avoid uh, use or avail of digital um, alternatives such as video conferencing, um, chat, email, etc. If it is unavoidable, observe social distancing during face to face interactions. The use of stairs are also encouraged, primarily because of the restrictions placed on elevator use. So it might take time for people to go up and down the elevator. So if stairs are available and if it's easier for them to use the stairs, then better. Especially if you have two stairways, it is recommended to have a unidirectional movement to facilitate social distancing. Meaning one stairway is only used to go up and one stairway is used to go down. What, what do you mean by help unidirectional movement is facilitate social distancing? Because if everyone is going one way, then you can ensure that people will not have to meet each other or stand beside each other, unlike if the stairway is being used two ways. This is also applicable to all hallways and passageways within a given office. Unidirectional movement is encouraged because it helps in social distancing. You avoid a situation where two people going the opposite direction will have to meet each other and stand beside each other. Lastly, have a system to monitor compliance. So either a designated person will constantly check or someone will have to go around the office to check compliance with the workplace health standards. Although I mentioned earlier that these guidelines are primarily guides, they do establish particular duties and impose particular duties on employers and employees alike. So first of all, you must have a COVID-19 company facility or company policy, sorry, which I emphasize now can include disciplinary measures for those who fail to observe workplace health standards. 
Second, you have to provide resources to your employees, meaning masks, soap, hand sanitizer, disinfectant, PPE. Third, you have to assign a COVID-19 safety officer and monitor so that someone is responsible for the COVID response of the office and someone is monitoring the situation at all times. Next, ensure that, health in the, that there is proper health insurance coverage of your employees. At this point, I'd like to emphasize Labor Advisory 4-2020, which states that if an employee is not covered by SSS and Field Health, the employer will be held liable for the medical bills of the employee. Of course, this is a, although this is what is stated under the labor, advi labor advisory, under the particular SSS and universal healthcare laws, as well as their implementing rules and regulations, the employer, for SSS, the employer's liability will be limited to the benefits to which the employee is entitled to. For the universal health care law, the employer's liability will be limited to the uh, remittances due or the contributions due. However, it imposes a 3% interest compounded monthly. So that even though it's, it's even possible that that might be more expensive than simply paying for the benefits entitled to the employee. Last, next. You have to also establish a COVID hotline or end a monitoring system so that employees will not need to come to work and can just simply call or email to report their symptoms. And also so that the employer can monitor all suspected cases at any given point in time. Lastly, employers are required to report to DOLE, to the DOLE's regional office, as well as the DOH by filling out the work accident slash illness report form of the DOLE. So that's a monthly reporting requirement. Now for employees' duties, actually it's just what? Comply with workplace measures. Everything else should fall under the workplace measures. So there's respiratory etiquette, um, disposing of tissues, disinfection of hands should be covered by the workplace measures and the workplace protocols. So I think, I believe this is the last slide for workplace health standards. The regulations or the guidelines issued by the DPI and DOLE also mention most at-risk workers or those who are vulnerable. Now, who are these people? They are the people who have who are whose trans travel is strictly regulated under IATF resolution number 30, meaning those above 60, immunocompromised with comorbidities, as well as those with high risk pregnancies. Now the question is, can they go to work? If we look at the IATF resolution, they can go to work only if it is indispensable under the circumstances. But if it's not, what can they do? As far as the DTI and DOLE are concerned, they are highly encouraged to avail of work from home arrangements and employers are also encouraged to provide work from home arrangements for most at-risk workers or the vulnerable, vulnerable workers. So for, these, for the work from home arrangements, the details of deliverables should be developed by the employer and commuted, communicated properly to their employees. Also those working from home should not suffer any diminution in wages or benefits. So somewhat related to the resumption of operations of businesses are the GCQ road travel regulations issued by the DTR, the Department of Transportation, and the uh, LTFRB. This is something you have to consider because we expect that a lot of employees will still have the difficulty going to work even under GCQ. Strict, strict regulations will be imposed both for private and public transportation. For private transportation, only the driver and the one other are allowed to sit in the front row. All other rows of a vehicle have a maximum of passengers. For public transportation, issue special permits and routes for buses, jeeps, 
roads, uh, ENVS, tricycles, etc. And these public transport operators will have to observe several sanitation and disinfection requires requirements. But most importantly, capacity limits have been set. Taxis have set the R. So for bus and jeeps, for buses and jeeps, they can only accommodate up to 50% of their maximum capacity. For UVS, only per row are allowed and one passenger at front row. For taxis, that's the same and for TNVS. For tricycles, only one passenger at the sidecar to ride. In addition to that, the trains of the LRT MRT will be subject to social distancing regulations, strict social distancing regulations. And according to them, waiting time will be expected to be two to three hours. So considering all these restrictions, it is important for employers and employees alike to plan ahead on how your employees will get to work on time and as scheduled, given the severe restrictions to be imposed on travel even under GCQ. So that's it for the ECQ and GCQ regulations. Now we go over the enforcement of these regulations during quarantine. So as I mentioned earlier, I will go through searches and seizures. And there are several kinds of searches and seizures. I'll go over them one by one and just give you uh, a practical tips in relation to how to avoid any complications or issues. So the first type of search is a search on your person, that is on your body, on your clothes. Generally, this is prohibited and uh, law enforcement officers have no right to search your person. Unless, one, you are under arrest, or two, they, they have a suspicion that you are armed and dangerous. This is what we normally call a Terry search for lawyers. This means that, of course, for arrest, um, even without the search requirement, or even without the officer searching you, we don't recommend you acting in a way that will put you under arrest. But with regard to avoiding acts which may arise suspicion that you're armed and dangerous, we cannot emphasize this enough, especially because even in some cases, it results in injury or death. It's always best to assume a courteous, a firm attitude towards law enforcement officers. Even lawyers adopt a very courteous attitude toward lawyers, uh, sorry, towards law enforcement officers. Um, and in case you are nervous or you have some doubts, feel, feel free to ask for time to contact your lawyer or to get some legal advice before complying with an order. But even with that request, again, please ask nicely and be courteous about it. Next would be checkpoints. Uh, expect that inquiries as to the purpose of your travel will be done and that documents will be required of you. So simply comply with these uh, requests. Also, only a visual examination of your vehicle is allowed. So anything beyond that is not allowed. Of course, especially if you don't expect any issues, you may voluntarily allow a more thorough search. Again, in case of doubt, you may ask for time to consult your lawyer or any other legal expert. And again, please be courteous and ask nicely. Lastly, and I think this is the most um, publicized, the search and the entry of private facilities and residences. As a general, general rule, you have the right to refuse entry. Of course, for you to refuse entry, we have to emphasize that you should be within your residence and the law enforcement officer should be outside. We don't recommend you coming outside your home is if you choose to refuse to entry. There are only a few exceptions to this. So one is if there is a warrant of arrest or search warrant and law enforcement officers will inform you of this fact. Next also is that they are pursuing a person to be arrested. An arrest has to be forthcoming or they have to have seen a person to be arrested 
and they have to believe that that person is within your residence for them to do this. Now, the number one issue, I think, with the publicized cases is that a portion of the residence or the private facility is viewable from outside or can be seen from outside. In these situations, and to avoid any conflict or conflict, Recommend all requirements that apply to this, even though you are within a place visible outside. So that's it for my end. Uh, I pass you now to my partner, Marlo.